alone. Was there anybody in there with them? No. Was there an audience? No. Was there any cameras in there so that we could stream this and it could go viral? No. There was nobody in there but the priest and God. And that is really important because what we've seen is that when this was instituted 3,600 years ago, we see that there has been 3,600 years of messing around with what it means to be a priest to, the tw to 2019 where we have something that's far, far, far different that when we, when we think of priest we think of something far, far, way, way, way different than what God instituted it to be. Okay? We've had, like I said, copies after copies after copies after copies after copies. 3,600 years worth of copies and messing with and, and adjusting man monkeying with it to the point where we've got something that is absolutely... We go, What? when we compare it to what God started with. Okay, so that's the priests, and if we're going to draw near to God, we've got to go in to this golden cabin with the weird roof. You remember, if you, if you weren't here, study it. <laughs> You'll see. Uh, anyway, uh, so what I want to do today is, I got first question is, if you're going to draw near to God, where are you going to find him? I mean, that's a question that hardly anybody ever asks. They say, yeah, well, you know, I want to be close to God. Well, where are you going to find him? First thing that comes to all men is in, the, in nature. See? Really? You know, if, if, and another one is at a big conference. Really? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get close to God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get and strengthen my relationship with God. And there's a whole bunch of man-made methods that have been, that have trampled over the top of the scriptures as to what, how you, how you get close to God. So where are you going to find him? It has to do with, you're going to find him in this little cabin. Six times in the book of Exodus, where a lot of this I'm finding that's where I do a lot of my reading and research is the book of Exodus. Six times just in that book. I'm not talking about Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I'm talking about just in that book. Six times it says, I will meet with you, God says through Moses, I will meet with you in the tent of meeting. And the tent of meeting is not a tent meeting. <laughs> Who do you meet in the tent of meeting? Only one. You don't meet a crowd at, at the tent of meeting. You only meet one. So, priests, Apostle Peter has told us without, without any question, and Paul says it in so many words in places, we'll get to that sometime, that we are still priests. We are still priests. That didn't, that's it. We don't have a that was then, this is now. We are still priests. So if we're going to be priests, you got to go into this tent of meeting. So let's take a tour of the tent of meeting. Let's just take a tour of the tent of meeting. All right, so. Early in the morning, you get up. That's the first thing. Early in the morning, you get up. Oh, I don't know if you have a cup of coffee or not, but the first thing you do, okay, let's see if I can get this thing to work. The first thing you do is that you go from your dwelling, your tent, and you go to what's called the brazen altar. That's this big, huge bonfire pit. It's huge. It's huge. It, it, it would take up this whole big area, and it was seven feet tall. And this thing had a bonfire. If you're going to burn whole bulls in there, ah, okay? 
So the first thing you do is early in the morning is that you go to this bonfire that's been kept going all night long, okay? And you take a, a big uh, uh, copper pan with handles on it, and you go to this fire, and you scoop up a bunch of coals, red-hot coals, red-hot coals. You get a pile of those. That's before you go to the tent, uh, to the cabin. Okay, then you take those, and then you go in. Look what it says. It says, he shall take a censer full of burning hot coals from off the brazen altar, okay, and then you go through the curtain into this tent, big thick curtain, uh, and you go in carrying this pan of coals, okay? Why? We'll get there. As soon as you go in, you see some stuff. But before you do anything, before you do anything, guess what you do? The first thing you do, remember it says you will give an account to God for what you do, not how you feel. The first thing you do is take your clothes off. <laughs> The first, I bet you didn't see that coming. The first thing you do is take your clothes off. You take your clothes off. S Steve is going into some kind of cataleptic fit right now. He's just... He's just <laughs> okay, but that's the first thing you do. And here's how I know that. Here's how I know that. Exodus 28 says this, Thou shalt make linen tunics, okay, Breast pieces, waistcoats, I'll, I'll, go, I'll, I'll give you the translation. Vests, uh, 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 belts, ponchos, long robes, caps, waist scarfs, and pants. You would, and why do you put those on in there? To cover your nakedness. Did you walk naked from your tent? Get the... Get those things, and no, no, that was not something God wanted. Pagan priests walk naked. God says, you're not going to be like them in public. <laughs> in public, okay? First thing you do when you enter into the cabin is you take off your clothes. Take off your clothes. And in a little cubby hole on the side there, there is all these clothes, all these linen garments that are in a little cubby hole, little cabinet there. And you put your clothes in the little cabinet and you take these clothes and you put them on. Uh, and uh, and that the first reason you put them on is to cover your nakedness. Okay? but you don't go before God with your own clothes on. You go before God with the clothes that he has ordered for you to wear in there. All right, the next thing is, is that uh, what's the next thing? There's another reason why you put these clothes on. Thou shalt make holy garments, and that's the breast pieces, the waistcoats, the ponchos, the pants, all that stuff. You will make holy garments. By the way, what does the word holy mean? That's right. Another way of saying it in 2019 English is reserved for God only. Do you got a reserved parking spot? Somebody else parks in it? Ooh, okay. Reserved for, these garments are reserved for God only. And why, so that's it. And they were made for this purpose, for glory and for beauty. I tell you, have you ever thought, some of you might have, do you know what these garments looked like? They were absolutely exquisite. They were made of the finest linen that weavers 
that had the skill of God on top of what they had learned in Egypt about weaving linen, making the finest snow white linen. Woven into and embroidered into this, all these linen garments was uh, incredible. You've seen embroidery from the Far East. I mean, we, we talk about Persian rugs and stuff like that. I tell you, they really do it. Amazing stuff. The intricacy and the, and, and, uh, uh, and the swirls and the geometric shapes and everything that were embroidered into this pure white garment. Here's the colors. Don't have it up there. Here's the colors that were woven and embroidered and dyed, by the way. There was, there was six craftsmen that did this uh, uh, to make these garments. There was six. There was jewelers. There was uh, dyers, craftsmen, seamstresses, all kinds of people. And here's what, they, here's what these garments, the colors were. Gold, sky blue, purple, Bright red. That's pretty flashy. And this is all on a background of pure white. That's pretty flashy stuff, right? Now, both men and women, but I'm just, just think about this for a second, ladies. If you could put on garments that made you beautiful, not only beautiful, but glorious. Bum, bum, bum. See? If you could put on garments that would make you the, 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 the jaw droppers, the, 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 the crowd stoppers of, with glory and beauty, and you only wore them in a dressing room with no mirrors. That's the only time you wore them is in a little dressing room that had no mirrors in it. And all the people said, what a waste. What a waste of beautiful garments. The reason you don garments for glory and for beauty, is to be seen by others. That's what, the, that's, that's, that's what we think. When God established this, He said, you put on these garments and nobody will ever see them. Nobody will ever see them, you guys. Because... You say, well, when he leaves, you know, everybody's going to go, whoa, <laughs> eh, we'll get there. Nobody will ever see them except, so who's the glory and beauty for? Our whole culture and society says, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. If I can't be seen by other people to be glorious and beautiful, well, then I'm not even going to try. I'm not even going to do it. Because if it doesn't amaze people, then it's not worth anything at all. Okay, so now we've got, the, we got in the door, and we've got these garments, and we've put them on. We took off the old stuff, we put on the new stuff, and the first thing that you notice is off to the left, there's this uh, candlestick. Candlestick. It's okay, and everybody, you may not know about any of the furniture in there, but you know about the candlestick. <laughs> okay, so you know what it's like. It's got, seven, it's got seven spots, and on top of those are seven lamps. And uh, what you must do at that point... Oh, oh, I got it. one more thing uh, on, the, on the bottom here. I'm most surprised. You got to get see this. Revelation 19.8 says, And it was given to her to be dressed in pure linen 
and the linen was the righteous acts of the saints. And it says righteous acts or the effects of righteousness. My question to you is if this fine linen is only worn in the cabin with an audience of one, who are the righteous acts done for? Come on. We think that righteous acts have to be a benefit to people. We think that righteous acts have to be something that somebody is going to go, wow, you sure are good. Or that was really good for me. And if the linen was given to her, there's only one place she could wear that linen. And that means that she was doing her righteous acts to who? To God alone. To God alone. Oh, you guys, candlestick, there's these lamps, and you, what you've got to do is that you have to fill those lamps from a jug of oil. You've got to fill those lamps up, and why would you do such a thing? Oh, I, I just love the thing is that uh, uh, when it says, it says, and, and, and the priest will dress the lamps, they will dress the lamps, and I looked it up and it says, make the lamps happy. Make the lamps glad. And uh, boy, I just was so impacted by what, uh, what Mary had to share last Sunday about just being in that cabin and that, there, that what she found in the midst of it all, that there was something called joy. She was making the lamps glad. For who? For her own benefit? Okay. All right. So why would you do this? Why would you make the lamps glad? Why would you make sure that everything is working properly? It says so in, e in Exodus 25. Whoa, I suppose we better change things here. Go on here. It said... Sorry, I'm, I'm really technologically retarded. There we go. Okay. It says in Exodus chapter 25, the reason why you dress the lamps and you make sure they're full of oil, and you've got to do this every morning and every night so that they burn all day and then they shine all night, okay, is for this reason... Leviticus 24, you shall, oh, oh yeah, 25, so to shine light on the table. So to shine light on the table. <gasps> there's a table. Oh, yeah, yeah there's a table. There, there's a table in there. It's to shine light on the table. Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about this table just a little bit. This table is uh, three feet long. It's, uh, it's uh, two feet wide, and it's about two feet high. So it's like one of our coffee tables, like one of our coffee tables. And the light shines on this table, but actually it's not so much the table that is to be shi the light is to be shined on. It's what's on the table that's the main attraction. The lampstand is the spotlight on something. And the spotlight is not on the priest. <laughs> Did you know that the spotlight is not on the priest? Does that sound like a 2019 minister? Man of God? A 2019 as opposed to the 1400 B.C.? The spotlight is not on the priest. It's on something called showbread. Showbread. Wow. All right. Leviticus 24, it says, Thou shalt take flour and bake 12 cakes with it and set them on the table. 
Now, these cakes are not these, our little wafers. See, remember our little wafers? Oh, thank you, Jesus. These things were seven pounds each. Seven pounds each. That's a keeper, isn't it? Okay, <clears throat> and there's 12 of them. There's, a, there's 12 of them that are put on this table. Uh, so you can't just spread them out. It, the table is too small. So you've got to stack them in two stacks of six. And so if the table is this high, and you've got seven, six, seven and a half pound cakes, you've got something that's, yeah, about like that. Okay, two, two stacks of them. Uh, on, one on top of the other. And on top of them, I'm going to just say it right now, is that the priests take a gold bowl and put it on top of one stack, and they take another gold bowl and they put it on top of the other stack. Why? We'll get there. So you've got this show, what do they call this, bread? They call it show bread. You've heard of show choirs. You've heard of show boats. You've heard of show girls. The reason why they're called that is because they are, the, the very reason for their existence is to show themselves to people. Show themselves to people. And the more, the better. What about these loaves? If they're showbread, who are they being shown to? Do you realize that these loaves never leave the cabin? They never leave the cabin. You say, but what about the people? They could use the bread. This stuff is never, it never leaves the, the cabin. So nobody ever, it's never shown to any person. It's only shown to one guy. The audience of one. Are you okay with the audience of one? This is a perfect uh, size group today to, to test how you feel about a small audience. The bigger the audience, the more you're filled with the Holy Ghost, right? The smaller the audience, oh, I just don't feel it. I just don't feel it, man. Showbread is only shown to one. All right. I was reminded of John 7, 4, uh, 4 where Jesus' family came to him and said, he said, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. That was the advice of the carnal mind. It goes on to say that they didn't even believe in Jesus at this time. They had no Holy Spirit. They were saying what the world says. If you do stuff, and he's talking about, wow, the, the beautiful garments talking about the light, talking about, whoa, the showiness of this whole thing. He says, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. I mean, nobody who wants to be known does these things in secret. So how is your desire to be known doing when it comes to a life with Jesus? Okay, so then the next thing that you'll find in there is it's called an altar of incense. And that is, uh, it's four feet tall, it's about two foot square. And it, uh, it sits right in the middle. And is there anything you need to do with that? Yes, there is. Priest, priest, hey priest, wake up, it's you that we're talking about here is you go to this two-foot square and you remember the coals that you took from the big bonfire pit? Well, now it's time to take those coals and empty them into 
this two-foot square pan that sits on legs. You empty those into there. For what reason? For what reason? It says, altar of incense. Let's see if we can move on here to the next thing. It says, make an altar as a place to burn incense. The reason why you put the coals in there is so that you've got something to burn something with. This is where the heat comes in. This is where heat comes into the little room. Oh, I just don't feel so good. That might be because there's hot coals. But where are the hot coals? Oh, if, I, if there's hot coals, then it can't be God. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. So here we have hot coals. All right. But the thing that is important about it is that you put something on the hot coals. Exodus 30, incense. Uh, by the way, incense uh, in, uh, in Hebrew is perfume made by fire. You cannot get this perfume unless you're in the fire. And I tell you what, I saw Mary and, and, and uh, John here last week, and I just, saw, I, just, I just saw incense going up off of them because they are in the fire. And some of the rest of you are definitely in the fire. I just, I'm not pointing them out because they're priests. They do this thing in secret. They do this in secret. And many of you are doing it in secret where you're in the fire and you're just going up in smoke. How are you doing when you're going up in smoke that nobody appreciates the fact that you're in the fire? That nobody notices how tough you got it? That nobody cares <laughs> if you're in the fire? Because there are no windows, nobody looking in the windows and going, oh, ooh, ah, ooh, boy, geez. There you are. And there's a perfume that comes off of that kind of secret faithfulness that cannot go up to God under any other circumstances. We live in a culture, we live in a church culture that says if it's, if it's hard, it's not God. I need to bind Satan more. And if it's hard, you must have sinned. And if it's burning, that definitely can't be something that's worth anything. And yet, this incense... It's made out of four sweet-smelling substances. And those substances are, three of them are dried juices from trees, and one of them is an eggshell. And so what uh, is happening there is that we've got this sweet-smelling substances, very expensive, very expensive. If you are going to go up in smoke, as a perfume made by fire, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you. Well, if it costs me, it can't be God. Because my gospel says is that God does everything for me. He's my shield and my butler. James? Hurry up, James. Oh, don't lag behind, James. And that's the, that is 2019 priesthood. That's not 1400 B.C. priesthood when it was originally put together there. So we have this... Okay, so now what we've got is that we have the coals in 
the, the altar, this little box. And so then you take some of the coals and you put some of the coals in the bowls on top of the showbread. Because something's got to burn there too. Then you take this incense. Oh, very costly stuff. And you sprinkle it on the fire, the, the coal, red hot coals. Then you take some of the more incense and you put it in these bowls on top of the showbread. How long do you think it's going to take for that 45 by 45 room to be absolutely filled with the smoke of the incense? Not very long. Not very long. You've got, you've got smoke coming off the olive oil that's coming off of the candles. You've got smoke coming off of the altar of incense. And you've got smoke coming off of the showbread. And it's all going up. But remember, there's no ventilation system. It's going to fill that little room up. It's going to permeate everything that's in there. It's going to soak into everything that's in there, including the priest. <laughs> including the priest. All right, so here we go. Uh, so now you've done the different things, but you're not done yet. Because the next thing that you have to do is that you have to, before you leave, before you leave, after you've done all these things in there, before you leave, it says, I know it's in here, Leviticus 16, Aaron, that's the priest, you know Aaron is a priest? Aaron, the priest, shall take off the garments which he put on when he went into the holy place. What garments are they? These beautiful, flashy, uh, stunning garments. Before he leaves, he has to take them off. Oh, shucks! I thought I was going to get a little bit of attention. I thought I was going to be able to Go outside the curtain and go, look at me, I've been with God. It's reading a book and the book had a lot of good things, but almost on every page the author made sure that he told us readers of all the amazing things they've been doing in the presence of God. And I tell you what, he killed the whole book for me. He killed it. Everything else that he was trying to say in there about the things that he had learned, just dead. Do you have intimacies with your wife? Do you blab them? How's your wife going to do if you blab those things out? That's the way the Lord feels if you decide. So you get up here and you say, you know, I was dancing before the Lord the other day. And I thought there was something that he gave me to share with you. Why would you say that? Why would you say, I was dancing before the Lord the other day, as a preface to reporting something that God wanted you to pro, uh, report to the fellowship? There's only one reason, and it wasn't to give glory to God. It was to give glory to Garments are for glory. Look at me. See, and we do it in all kinds of little ways where we just can't stand the fact that nobody's going to know. We just can't stand it. Because the praise of men, we love more than the, what did Jesus say? The praise of God. And the whole thing. All right. So, he takes them off. You say, well, okay. So that takes care of some of that beautiful aroma. I thought I was going to be able to go out and the, and the, and the aroma was going to wave around as I walked through the masses of people. They were going to go, wow. 
And that's what our gospel tells us, is that we go to the presence of God. Why? So that we can go out in public and they can smell the sweet aroma of God. That's not... God made sure you take off the garments. Oh, but you're not done yet. Before you put on your street clothes, you have to wash in the cabin. You have to wash not just your hands and feet like when you went in. You have to wash your whole body. Shampoo to hair, beard, all this stuff to make sure that when you leave, nobody's going to smell it. Put that in your pipe and smoke it for a while. Because we think the reason why I go to God is so I've got something to give to the people. That is not the true gospel. If that's the, if that's the religion you want, there are other religions that do a better job of getting something to give to the people than Christianity does. Christianity is not to meet the needs of the people. Christianity is to subjugate everything to the will of God. Whew. All right. Wow. I love to research. I mean, I don't love to research. I do it even if I don't feel like it, okay? Do you think you can love something without feeling it? That's Christianity. Did some research, did a lot of research actually to come up with these uh, statistics. Two thirds of the priest's life, do I have that anywhere on here? No. He will leave them there, he will wash his body and he will put on his clothes again. What do you present to the people out there? I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy. Now you are something special. and Steve is always after us about we're something special. But where are we special and who are we special to? We think that you are something special because Christianity will make us something special to the eyes of men, you've got to join another group. Because this is not designed to do that at all. Two-thirds of the priestly life is away from public view. Two-thirds of the priestly life is away from public view for God's benefit alone and not your benefit. One third of the priest's life is in public view for God's benefit alone, but it could benefit some people. But whether you're doing it out in the public view or whether you're doing it in the private out of view it's always to God alone if you're serving people for some other reason you're not a priest <laughs> you're not a priest you might be something but you're not a priest all right my point and I'm going to make it eventually here is this I've been thinking about 1 John 2, 15 and 16. Especially the, verse 16, where it says this. You can look it up. It says, all that is in the world. All that is in the world. Oh, man, I tell you, there's, if, there, if, if, if the theories about this were water, we'd all been drowned. I'm going to throw one on top of it. Take this one and chew on it. All that is in the world, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life, are not from the Father. They're not from God and they don't please God at all. 
But let's take a look. I, I looked into this a little bit. I like to look into stuff. I let it go. Anyway. Uh, the word all in this word. All, it says all that is in the Father. Oh, remember I said a long time ago, I said watch out for the word all because it can mean a whole bunch of different things. you got to do some research to find this. But the word all there means everyone doesn't mean whatever people thought it means everyone in this book of John alone that word all is used six times in that little letter of John and every other time that the translators translated it they translated it everyone Except here. What's up with that? Ooh, don't get me going. The next word is the lust. Lust. What is lust? Lust is this. Hunger, longing, or craving. When, it, when you take a look at the word lust in the Greek, this word lust in the Greek, has a, has, a, has a suffix on the end of it. So if we take a word and we say, uh, play, that can mean a whole lot of things. But if I say player, we've added a suffix onto the end and it changes the whole thing. Suddenly now we know we're talking about somebody who plays. Got it? Well, that's the same with this word here, is it doesn't mean lust as, the, as in the word play, like a noun. It means luster. It, the word is luster, one who lusts, one who hungers, one who craves. Okay? The word eyes, whoa, here was a big surprise for me. I ran this by Steve and Rocky a few times. They said, hmm, interesting. That's all they would say about it. But as I looked into this word, I found out that eyes can mean a whole lot of things in the Scriptures. Eyes can mean a whole lot of things in the Scriptures. And in this case, eyes means, <laughs> it says so right, it, right in vines. You can go right into vines or strongs. It says, eyes means lookers, viewers, eyewitnesses. So, here's Gary's rendition of that verse. Anyone who craves viewers is not of the Father. Apostle John, I believe that that's what the Apostle John was saying. He wasn't talking about looking at pornography. He wasn't talking about coveting yet a 60th pair of shoes. Ooh. He was talking about a craver of eyes. I desire eyes on And if eyes are not on me, then I'm a failure. And whatever it is I was doing or being or the, any character that I have that is not up for view is not worth it. Why try? It's got no benefit. If it doesn't benefit man, if it doesn't benefit me, then it don't benefit anybody. This is a part of priesthood that says anyone who craves viewers is not of the Father. And you know what our culture is like. You know what our culture is like. So you say, whoa, that may, that, 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 I've never heard that before. Well, have you heard this? Have you heard this one? Jesus. Take care not to do your righteousness. Remember we talked about what righteousness was? It was fine linen. It was only worn in the cabin. Take care that you don't do your righteousness, here we go, in order to be seen of men. 
take care that you do not do your righteousness, that they may have glory of men. Garments for glory? No. Stay in the dressing room. Take care that you do not your righteousness, that they may be seen of men, that they may appear unto men, because they love the praises of men. And it goes on to say, more than the praises of God. And that's where we start getting this conflict and decides that if I don't get some credit for this, it's not worth doing. That shows what a low esteem we have of God and what a high esteem we have of men, of people, of audiences, of, of, of whatever we're looking for men for in there. Colossians says this. It says, they have the appearance of wisdom. And what it's talking about, Rocky has been talking to us about this one here, and he'll probably talk to you more about it too, is that they means all kinds of religious activity. All kinds of religious activity have the appearance of wisdom, but they only indulge their flesh. Pretty hard hitting. So, priests forsake the 2019 idea of what a man of God, a woman of God is, a servant of God. Forsake it. Turn your back on it. It's of the world. All the things that are in the world, the craving for viewers. He said, you know, you say, oh, I got a revelation. I have got to go on the road. In fact, we know of many who have said, I'm seeking God for revelation so I can make a living off of it. Well, I'm just praying that, that our love for the cabin would grow. And that all this 100% of our effort to do something for mankind, we'd get weaned off of that. To putting our time and our effort into blessing the Lord. Blessing the Lord. We sing, bless the Lord, but what we're, what we're saying is, bless me, the, O Lord. And we're, we're talking about, this is for you and you alone. I don't care if this is ever known by anybody else. That is an aroma made by fire can you go up and smoke? Can you just go up and smoke just for Jesus' sake? Just the world looks at all these things, all the expense of the incense, the expense and the amazingness of the clothes, the bread, and all this stuff. And, and, and man says, what a waste. What a waste! Does that sound like somebody that we know about in the New Testament? Yeah, you know the one we're talking about there. What a waste! Can you waste it on God? Is He that important? Or is He low on the priority list so that you've got to waste it on people, otherwise it's of no value at all? God help us with these things.